Okay. We should now be live. I'm looking to see who else is, there is in the room. Are there other people listening to us? And I think a total of nine. We have got nine people. We have other people in the room. Excellent. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this afternoon. And we continue with the exciting program that Horasis has offered us. During this program, you will have been very much aware that uh, the subject of the Sustainable Development Goals has been absolutely central to a lot of the conversations. Another aspect that has also been played with a lot are the issues of COVID and what that is, the impact of COVID on financing. And here in this panel, I'm delighted to say that I have got a very fine and wise group of participants to help us try and look at how those come together, if indeed they can come together, or if there are contradictions between the way in which we can finance the Sustainable Development Goals um, and uh, what types of financing structures we need to look at. You will have seen, all of you who are attending, that the subject of this is really focused on blended finance. Uh, so I'm going to very briefly introduce, and it will be a brief introduction, um, my, uh, the participants we have here. And then after that, I'm going to move very quickly into the conversation. My job is not to speak. My job is for them to speak. So firstly, let me, and I'm doing this in alphabetical order, introduce, and I'm going to ask them to raise their hands. I think you probably see their names on the screen anyway. Bernard Bauhofer, who is the founder and managing partner of Sparring Partners Switzerland. Bernard has a career that has... Uh, he brought him to a space where he is an expert in reputation management and crisis management. I have to say that in the context of uh, the SDGs, he's probably also very good at avoiding greenwashing. We'll come to that a bit later. Michael Drexler, Michael's going to raise his hand now. He is a senior strategic advisor at Bright Star Capital Partners in the USA. Michael is a banker by training and background, but he's now operating in private equity, a space he knows extremely well because he ran, amongst other things, the investor community and the impact community at the World Economic Forum, where I had the great pleasure and privilege of working alongside him. Next, we come to Krista Jory, who is the CEO and co-founder of Lead on Purpose in the UK. She has been, uh, after a long career in the, um, in, in the business world, she's been working particularly on researching, monitoring, and driving the results of leaders on, with purpose and seeing what that implies to business performance. She also has an advisory business related to that. Next, Peter Lorenz Nest. Chief Executive Officer of AAVI Advanced Added Value International in Germany. Peter is a physicist and a serial business entrepreneur with a very strong systemic approach, which came out in the pre-briefing. I think we're going to find a very focused uh, scientific mind in our conversations today uh, with Peter. And I come now to Elidio de Ayala Serogio, President of PCG Pro Fabril Group in Portugal. Elidio is an engineer. He's running a large engineering consulting group. And he also has a very active role in the leadership of the Portuguese Chinese business relationship. There we are, quick synoptic descriptions of our, of our panelists. And now I'd like to move on directly into the conversation. We're not going to do long introductions. But um, I think what I'd like to do first, just simply to make 100% sure that our audience knows what we're talking about, the Sustainable Development Goals, I'm sure everyone is familiar with. That's been so much a topic today. But blended finance is a little bit more specific, and sometimes there are some odd perceptions as to what it is. Michael, I wonder if you might just give us a quick minute on what exactly blended finance means. Just to set the scene for our conversation. Very happy to, and it won't be more than a minute. It's a very simple concept. It basically says, traditionally, you have the private sector financing private sector stuff, and you have the public sector financing public sector stuff. And 
The private sector looks for profits. The public sector looks for long-term social impact. And the twain shall never meet. And blended finance breaks down that border and says, wouldn't it be great if you could have the public sector invite the private sector for both money, but also best operating practice to achieve societal mm -hmm. long-term goals? That introduces all sorts of complexity, of course, because the vocabularies are not the same and the incentives are not the same on both sides. But at its very fundamental core, blended finance is a very, very sensible and useful concept that says two universes that historically haven't cooperated should now cooperate it in achieving the right outcomes. Michael, thank you very much indeed for that. And of course, it's a it's an interesting perspective, this notion of two, two universes that don't cooperate a great deal. There is perhaps a third universe, which is the third sector, that is not necessarily represented here on this panel. Um, but uh, to a certain extent, I suppose that, Chris, you may be able to speak to that as you come at least from the academic perspective of the third sector, if not so much from the, uh, the not-for-profit aspects of it. Um, Right. Against that context of blended finance, which is saying basically we bring government and private sector together. And in the context of the questions of this panel, we're talking about how do we make that work for the sustainable development goals? But it's also in the context of an overall challenge about investment. We there is nine trillion dollars unused capital which should be flowing into impact investment. Of that, the United Nations believes that we need to see about 2.5 trillion is the funding gap on an annual basis um, of, of, of the total 3.9 that is required to actually, uh, on an annual basis, to move towards the sustainable development goals in that period of 2015 to 2030. We're a third of the way through that. <laughs> First question, and I put this out to the panel, um, do you think that COVID has really put irrevocably or to a great extent a very long delay on the implementation and the flows of capital into the sustainable development goals? Perhaps, Chris, could I turn to you for a comment on that quickly first? And then after that, I would move to Peter. Sure. I, I think that um, the private sector has, you know, filling the gap for the sustainable development goals, the private sector has to be involved in that. And so um, I think, uh, as, as Peter talked about just earlier, or, um, or Mike, I'm sorry, you know, the bringing these two together to fill that funding gap pre or post COVID or during COVID, um, I think it, it still needs to happen. We need mecha mechanisms in place to be able to do that. So one of the <coughs> things that we recently worked on was uh, with the fourth sector group is uh, was a letter where we worked with private sector leaders to um, really bring some guidelines for governments to unlock some of that through creating an enabling environment for purpose led businesses to develop market based solutions to public problems. And um, I do think that um, investors now, as they're looking to make investments, are measuring, you know, not only the fiscal impact, but also the social impact and uh, recognize that, you know, the capital markets need to make some, there needs to be some structural change in the capital markets to, to do that and incentives to do that as well. Chris, thank you very much indeed for that. And um there are a couple of trigger words in what you were saying there for me and I believe for Peter in the sense that, uh, and Peter, your, um, I, your microphone is on mute, I see. Um, the mechanisms, you talk about the need for mechanisms and structures and you talk also about the need for government to be involved. In our earlier conversations, Peter, those were two pieces which were very important for you, the systemic approach to it and, and also the importance for government to be involved. Perhaps a perspective from you. Yeah, <clears throat> let me give you an example uh, of that uh, with respect to Germany. Uh, we have been active in the EEG law back then, uh, 20 years ago, and uh, that actually gave a framework for individual investors to invest in sustainable energy. Uh, back then, you know, being a physicist in the 80s, 
I was laughing about that project because uh, the uh, photovoltaic uh, cells, uh, uh, PV cells, would, uh, got got more energy to to be produced than they ever produced in the lifespan. That was in '86. So, but uh, 20, uh, no, actually, or many many years later now. <laughs> uh, Actually, th that kind of efficiency increased from 2.6% uh, to almost uh, 21 on a uh, market base that you can buy right now. Uh, be, be aware the uh, theoretical uh, border is 36%. Beyond that, it's not possible. So we have achieved a lot, and the government set an incentive. And that's uh, why I, I believe in giving some incentives on the one hand side to pull uh, people in some directions, but do not prescribe what they are doing. So let them do it themselves. Say, send them in a direction and let them find their way. Let them find what they pick up on the way and what they have uh, discovered and, you know, let them let them do it. And then uh, help them, um, you know, on a uh, path to, uh, to smoothen it, you know, but if they, you know, you won't discover anything new if you don't get it. Go new new ways and new path. So that's my, my approach, and uh, I think uh, overall uh, it has proven to be very very uh, wise to do that. Costly in the first place, but you know the unseen cost of atomic power uh, need to be considered as well. So uh, now the energy of green energies are actually comparable to coal or uh, atomic power plants, and if you if you to, uh, take take a total cost of ownership approach, and I think we're on a good way to to do that uh, to to go in the right direction. So uh, to to end up with it, uh, my my strategy in the future is if you paint your photovoltaic cells on every wall with a paint, you know, then we have so much space, and even three percent would be enough to have enough electricity. Peter, thank you, because we've had both. Uh, a structural and process and systemic response, and also at the end, a technological response mm -hmm. uh, solution. Thank you very much for that. Sure. Um, I think you, you speak very much to one of the fundamental questions that we're debating on this panel, and that is the role of government. And does government nudge or incentivize, or does government does government encourage or enforce? Now, what is the role of government in this? But stepping back a little bit from that and back into this current uh, COVID environment, um, I'd, I'd like to go to burnout because I'd like to have a perspective, a broader perspective of, um, in a sense, what is a public set of responsibilities? <coughs> Public sector development financing capacity is severely reduced. Governments are putting a massive amount of money into lifeboats for their domestic economies. Development financing severely reduced. And the priority is charity begins at home. Now, can we justify that in terms of the SDGs, recognizing that the SDGs, in many people's perspective, are for lower developing countries or less developed economies, but actually, of course, they do apply all around us. Bernard, I'd like to get your, your perspective of the public views, public aspects of that, what you think some of the challenges are there also for perhaps uh, governments trying to decide where they put their bucks. Well, I think now uh, when we get the, the big picture, as you say, and we're talk, looking at the social development goals, uh, which are a, a global framework, um, which has to be applied. It's, it's very theoretic and there are objectives, but nobody knows how exactly, or few people know exactly how to break it down, to operationalize it in the investment processes and so forth. But I think what um, what the problem is now currently in the COVID, uh, governments, public, are, are really uh, impacted by fear. They don't want to invest <clears throat> And then the, the uh, trend towards isolation of governments and, and countries is absolutely um, opposite to what the SDGs are, want to achieve. And I think one has to see that. And the best practice of um, blended finance is key to show how governments can structure those kind of deals and they have to take over the lead. And I think at the very end, and that's Chris's topic, it's about purpose and it's, uh, it's about responsibility, responsibility of governments, of authorities, 
of all stakeholders in, in, a, in a country and on a global scale, um, we have to join forces to make this happen. And um, we have to incentivize everyone who is le jumping into this uh, sort of investments. They have to be guided, they have to be shown the way, and we have to share experiences. I think putting this on a, on a global picture, I think um, there has to be a peer pressure as well. Uh, if one, the first ones uh, who are supporting these kind of best of worlds financing um, concepts, they should be incentivized and they should be awarded for that. And those experiences should be shared with other countries. Against Israel isolation, I think people have to join forces. They have to think beyond their boundaries and frontiers and, um, and, and join forces. Well, now that's very interesting and that, that, that comment about reward, that reward word is a challenging word. How do you reward them? Do you reward them as we do in the UK with a knighthood? Or do you actually reward them with economic incentive? And if it's economic incentive, does that suggest that actually government has to perhaps reduce its return in order to give an economic incentive to the private sector coming in? It's, I, I'm going to switch from you. I pass the question on to Elidio because Elidio operates in a space where this is absolutely prime. He's in the infrastructure space, which classically has been a place for blended operations. The public-private partnerships in the infrastructure space essentially rely on a blended finance. And perhaps government should be subsidizing the private sector into that as a reward. Over to you for a few comments and your perspective on that. Uh, yes, as an engineer, that's where we've been involved in uh, physical infrastructures uh, financed by by the state, by the government, and or sometimes by PPPs. The thing is this, you know, most of our uh, network of uh, toll roads in Portugal are uh, were done uh, with the PPPs, uh, but the government always feels that uh, they gave up too many profits. To the, to the private companies. So this is a, one of the problems. Governments should encourage private investment. But depends if it's a right wing or left wing. If it's left wing, they say, no, no, no. Uh, companies cannot have so high profits. But that's the only way to, 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 make, uh, to make private people to pick up uh, infrastructures or uh, health uh, hospitals or something, something like this, or industries, energy, and so on. Because otherwise, the states are, uh, they have to have the funds. Normally, they are underfunded. A lot of countries, and especially with COVID, a lot of uh, billions or, I don't know, trillions all over the world have been uh, eroded. And it's very difficult for governments to go back to these infrastructures and do that. So either they stop uh, do, doing this and they take uh, small measures to, to keep the economy going, or they ask the private sector to invest uh, with funds, uh, with PPPs, whatever. So that's, uh, I think that's where I, th uh, I think the government should really look into this. Uh, they have to be convinced, the, the government, of course, but the investors now is the time to invest in a lot of uh, things. And there is, as you know, trillions of uh, dollars available and uh, that's where i think uh, governments have to to look into the development of them because that's good for for the public for the for the small guy in the street they need the roads and they need hospitals and they need the airport or port or railways so government really needs to prime the pump government needs to be prepared to get things moving to catalyze and get things moving um Michael, I'm going to take some words of yours from a previous conversation on this, and I wonder if you could expand on it. Your comment was, this can work, but it's fiendishly difficult. And one of the reasons is that the vocabulary is completely different on each side. Government speaks one language and private investors speak another language. Could you expand a bit about uh, on that? And then I'm going to, after that, move back to Chris to ask her whether she can find a way to knit them together again and to find ways to bring the language or find a common language. Michael, over to you first on that. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Piers. And I'll also try to look at some of the questions that came up in the chat and try and address them while I make this point. So in my experience, very often you have the public sector asking for investment and mm -hmm. then the private sector says, oh, but this is the return that should come with that investment. The public sector yeah. the representative goes, hey, uh, what, what do you mean return? We just wanted your money. <laughs> and so what they were thinking when they said investment was actually a grant. Um, but then you have the private sector conversely saying, oh, by the way, when, uh, when we want to invest here, we need risk sharing. And what they really mean is the government takes all the risk so we can take all the return. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you can figure out, yeah. neither of those works very well. Both of them are pretty acrimonious. And in that spirit, the two questions that came up on the chat, so how, how do you make this work, is you can only make it work by binding the two together around the common mm -hmm. objective and by agreeing on what is an acceptable return to society and and therefore what is the engagement model with the private sector and where the systems are weak in a country and where the institutions are weak and there is corruption you often have to bring in a third party like a multilateral development bank that helps strengthen those systems mm -hmm. and helps both the public That's sector true. in country and the private sector to make the investment but uh, you shouldn't be surprised that initially the vocabulary is very different on both sides. You have to bring them together and you also have to overcome what I call return envy. So sometimes uh, you have foundations saying, why should we allow people to profit from financing a cause that we care about? That's not how we think. And the question I always have to the foundation is, are you envious of other people's money or are you actually trying to solve a problem? If you're trying to solve a problem, stop being envious and find an acceptable agree, uh, way of sharing the, the returns and the profits. But don't say no, because saying no won't solve your problem either. And with that, over to, over to you, Chris. Well, Michael, I'll just interject there. The question of language um, in the foundation space is also critical. Um, my own experience sitting on the investment committee of an NGO was that for the first six months, while I used the word profit, they really were uncomfortable with me. The minute I switched that to saying surplus, we had a good dialogue. We had removed a difficult piece of language there. What, what was the word? Sorry? What was the word? Surplus. A okay, okay. I went from profit to surplus. Surplus was acceptable. Profit was not. <laughs> Chris, over, over to you. Um, that honest broker role, um, mm -hmm. to a certain extent, the multilateral development bank, absolutely so helpful to have a third party in the room to depolarize the relationship. Um, how do you see that? And how do you see... Particularly, how do you see the evolution of business leadership and private sector leadership being aware of and welcoming that type of uh, third party in the room to help, if you like, defang the discussion? Yeah, it's such a good question. And I think it gets down to, I think the idea of these um, private sector and cross-sectoral collaboration, whether it be PPP or any number of other areas, you know, it's, it's a matter of trust and risk. You know, I think Mike did such a good job at, at really kind of unpacking what that means. Um, but the role of these multilateral institutions like MEGA to risk insurance is, is something that as we're looking at foreign direct investment into these countries that maybe have some instability can help to mitigate some of the risk and to, to build trust that uh, making this investment is something that uh, the organization might want to do. And um, but But this idea about how do we bridge that trust? And, and, you know, we call ourselves leaders on purpose. We've all talked about how, you know, strategy, uh, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast and purpose is really the bridge between culture and strategy. And so I think Mike talked about this idea of the language and agreeing on what is the purpose that we're trying to achieve here. I think we also see, you know, uh, agreeing up front on the pace, you know, there's, when we look at these uh, multi-sectoral collaborations, pace, language, purpose, accountability, there's four things that 
need to be established up front. And when that's done, these organizations can really thrive. So we've seen in COVID how organizations that have already developed that sort of backbone of the organization have been able to be much more nimble because they have trust, because they've worked in this way on maybe one project. Um, they've been able to pivot and, and, and address some of the, the, you know, systemic issues that, that are arising from COVID. So I think once they do it, it pays off. It is to, to absolutely uh, a difficult um, task up front, but, but I think it can be very valuable long term. Chris, thanks very much for that. And, and one of the dimensions that I, I, get, I take away from that is this question of how can you be, um, how can you measure the changes that are happening? How can you measure the progress in those dimensions that you're talking about? Because some of them feel a little bit qualitative and difficult to put actually hard numbers against. Um, and ultimately, perhaps, in order to have a good conversation, you need to have a fact-based approach. Peter, I turn to you as the physicist, the scientist here, um, and, and I wonder whether you feel that we are making progress towards in some form of common understanding of metrics, of um, clear, objective ways of communicating and making progress in the space of the SDGs and blended finance. There's been a lot of talk, and to a great extent, the measurement of impact or, is, is, is a holy grail for the sector. But Peter, what do you think from your from the perspective of your, your, your very systemic mind? What I have been observing is um, that in certain areas, there may be more sense of uh, Good um, more sense of the uh, needs of the other parties rather than in, uh, for example, in the en energy business. They have developed over 20 years uh, communications and they have found out what works, what are the terminologies, what is the investment risk and what should be the returns. So there is a common base for a common understanding and a common base for communication and discussions between investors and uh, regulators. Uh, whereas in other industries, that may have uh, still to evolve. And uh, so it's an approach and some experience uh, required in certain uh, sectors. Some of them are uh, at uh, the forefront, uh, front runners, and some of them are laggards. So, laggards. so uh, uh, I think we cannot um, say it's the same in every uh, aspect. And probably it differs uh, all over the world in different countries, industries, and sectors. Challenging, isn't it, when you have that multidimensional approach? Very difficult indeed to come to a, a clear single set of metrics. And after all, the SDGs are meant to be a global framework. They're not meant to be just local frameworks. They're meant to be a global framework with you know, a very firm approach to moving forwards with country roadmaps, etc. They're also meant to be, and I'm picking up Simona Filippini's question here, where she says, where do you see systemic improvement happen? It feels as if many countries are trapped in a never-ending cycle of dependency of external funding. How to break that circle? Um, Simona, I'm going to ask Bernhard to, have, uh, to respond to that a little bit, because I suspect there is a difference between perception and reality. Just as if you ask most people if the world is getting poorer, they will say yes. Whereas actually, if you look at the facts, more people have been coming out of poverty. But there is a certain amount of uh, intrinsic pessimism. Um, I'm not accusing you of that, Simona. But I'd like Bernhard perhaps to address that whole notion of perception um, coming from his, 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 his pulpit in that space. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, COVID has interrupted this... Um, trend. Um, the question is, is now long term, is it short term? Out of poverty, we're seeing that uh, particularly the emerging markets and the, the poorest of the poor are thrown back into extreme poverty. And I think the dependence on, on the rest of the world is even increasing. Uh, and this makes the pressure even more urgent to uh, support those people. It's about managing expectations in terms of for, for the investors. I think they have to take the long-term perspective. Sustainability is all about the long-term perspective. 
and um, not waiting for instant returns, particularly when it comes to emerging markets and the poor markets. They need urgently need infra support for infrastructure, for education, for um, all this, the, the simplest of, of anything we, we, we are taking for granted. And I, I had the chance to, in 2018 and so 2019, to moderate the Safe Sustainable Finance Conference in um, in, uh, in <laughs> I, I had the uh, privilege to have uh, the representative of the US, uh, the UN of in Liechtenstein in the panel I moderated and I think and that's our big hope that this new generation I think we if we're talking about this um, blended finance and how we get out of this crisis and and develop and form our future we have to take into consideration the future generation millennials and they are definitely willing to make this world a better place particularly for the people who are now very hit hard very hard, uh, hard uh, hit by the by this uh, corona crisis um, i fear that the dependency will grow and um, i'm not an expert in the world bank but i i think uh, there has to be um, solutions for that Bernard, well, no, thank you very much indeed for that um I, I wonder whether this younger generation you talk about is also prepared to put its money where its mouth is. If it is mm -hmm. prepared to compromise um, its long-term personal financial health um, by saying, okay, we contribute more to the public purse or we contribute more in development dollars. A, a challenging one. And Elidio, I'm going to slide this over to you because although you spent much of your time in what we might describe as hard infrastructure there is also critical to this is soft infrastructure health education for example are absolutely critical elements of social infrastructure going forwards and um i wonder what your perspective is in terms of the priority of investing in those and this is going to drive us a little bit also into the much longer term returns we're talking here about generational returns that generation that bernard was talking about so let's move from the broader perspective down into okay how do we make money come into multi-generational infrastructure, multi-generational investments, which is actually where the SDGs are driving us to a great extent. How do we make that happen in video? And is blended finance again a piece of that puzzle? Well, it's a very good uh, question. Uh, but at the end of the day, we'll find always a way. Because first of all, we say COVID is a problem now. Of course, we had the subprime before. We had wars even in Europe and the Middle East and so on. There's always something disrupting the, 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 the world of, uh, of investment and so on. But this, the countries and the population and the, the governments have to keep on investing. And of course, if it's government or if it's private, depends exactly on, on the issues we've been uh, discussing about short-term uh, return on, or not. For example, health. We have uh, private health in Portugal, uh, which is it works very well. In fact, uh, uh, private hospitals can work with the regular people. I think in the UK they, they have the same, the same situation. But the left wing is totally against that. They say should be the state doing this. And the state cannot, cannot give a service that the privates normally do. And this is the, 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 the difference between the, the long term and so on. Long term, okay, you can say in 30 years time, we'll have, uh, you know, green, uh, green, uh, everything, uh, green energy. And in as, uh, as, as uh, you, you mentioned before, uh, energy has sorted out the problem of, fun of funding and return. But I tell you, in Portugal, there is a big, big issue of the returns of uh, of um, of energy, the, the 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 profits. In fact, in our case, we have to split uh, a third to a company called China Three Gorges. It is very happy because after six or seven years of investment, they already got all the money back. And so it shows that even the long term things have a different perspective than shorter term. And this is where the, the governments have to put some effort, but they have to combine with the, with the private uh, uh, interests because that's the, the ones who will drive the, 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 the things to go through. Because uh, we have some examples of ports and railways and airports. We always talk about this, make plans, we award, 
and suddenly, because it's a long-term thing, suddenly they cancel the whole thing. So there's no investment. So, so this is a very uh, um, difficult situation between private and public. Public wants to do, and they make big plans. Where I was yesterday in a, in a dinner, we talk about fantastic plans for the le- next 30 years. Well, it's the same plans we had 30 years ago. <laughs> so this is another, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's depressing when that happens. And I wonder whether we need to actually move forward in shorter, more effective steps. Michael, yeah. you're advising a private equity fund. Private equity funds typically work on a much, uh, um, oh, Michael's disappeared as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm losing my, comes, my comes, yes. <laughs> Michael, you're advising a private equity fund and private equity funds work on shorter cycles, typically a five, seven, possibly a 10 year up or eight plus two cycle. Um, to what extent do you think that you actually have a role to play in private equity, the more classic private equity, in trying to finance some of these uh, longer term uh, opportunities? Oh, and Peter's back too. Peter, I'm going to come to you later with, with Jean-Francois's question about risky investment at the limit of technical feasibility. But Michael, first to you. Sure, and let, let me split private equity into several parts here and also caution against the the ever-present call for idle or unused capital to go into whatever people think is the right mm-hmm. answer. And let me start with this one. So at Brightstar, we probably have about a billion dollars in dry powder available to, to deploy right now. But guess what? Our investors are telling us we want you to deploy this into U.S. mid-sized companies uh, to help them grow mm-hmm. over a five to seven year time horizon because that's what we hired you for because that's what you're historically been good at. Now, if Brightstar were to say we're going to deploy this money into sub-Saharan African energy, uh, our investors would withdraw <laughs> the money immediately because they go, well, we have other people who can exactly. do that. Thank you very much. And so a caution to everyone in the room, this idea of unused capital that can go like water wherever we want it to is a very dangerous one. <laughs> And that, that now brings me to the style boxes of private equity. So currently, the majority of private equity operates on a five to seven year horizon because the mandate is to buy a company and then turn it around, make it better, increase the cash flows, increase the profitability, and then, in a sense, let the company fly on its own wings again, either IPO you or sell it to somebody else. And that model historically is a five to seven year horizon. There are private equity firms that specialize in infrastructure and no surprise, they have their funds committed to 20 to 25 years. And so already you see the industry tailoring its solutions to what the problem is that tries to be solved. And now the crossover is in traditional private equity. We've realized that some companies need more than five to seven years and also some owners of companies like families in particular want holding periods of more than five to seven years. And that's why you see a trend towards longer, longer funds or even evergreen funds in traditional private equity. But again, these things are not easy. So when I go to my investors at Brightstar and say, by the way, I want to increase my holding period from five years to 15 years, they will say, oh, let's go and think about that because we paid you for five to seven years. That's what you told us you would do. (laughs) So uh, difficult answer to your question, Piers. Uh, The principal answer is, of course, private equity, like everyone else in the private sector, has a role to play and will play a role in all of this. But it's not like we can change operating models from today to tomorrow because they have a history of working and for the, for the benefit of both the pensioners who invest in private equity funds through pension funds and the companies that we own, uh, we need to prove these new models. And that, again, takes time. Frustrating, but true. Michael, thanks, thanks, thanks for that, Michael. And I think one of the things that nevertheless comes out to me is when you talk about the mandate you have from your investors, which may be a five to seven years, that is already longer than most political cycles. Mm. Exactly. Four Four years. (laughs) Four Four years. years. And and in those four years, how much is actually operationalized by the political uh, class? Not a great deal. They're working on two years because there's election periods coming up, as we've seen. 
Um, I'm going to move. We, we, we've got literally three, four minutes left. Peter, I'm going to ask you to very quickly respond to Jean-Francois' question, which was, can you please address very risky investment at the limit of technical feasibility? If you can give, do that in 20 seconds, and then I'm going to do a round of everyone else for a roundup comment or your last soundbite into the, into the, into the uh, discussion. Peter, to you. Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Piers. If uh, technology is very risky to develop, uh, we cannot expect companies without enough funds uh, to go into that direction. So if a society decides we want to go into that direction, that is our goal, then they need to incentivize it. Otherwise, uh, decent companies won't do it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to go now to Bernhard. Bernhard, your, your, your wrap-up thoughts. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, uh, we, we gained fantastic insights from different perspectives on the best of both worlds, finance <laughs> approach. And I think um, even though we have totally different mindsets, totally different approaches to investing, I think both parties have to find a new technology, uh, find a new attitude and the willingness to think and act long-term. Otherwise... But the world needs this, and if we want to um, achieve uh, the sustainable uh, development goals, we have to work together. I think that's. It that might sound uh, idealistic, but it's inevitable. And do your corporate clients believe that as well? Well, the reality, to be honest, is different. Uh, sometimes, um, of course, there is a massive pressure when it comes to uh, return on investment and the shareholder value. At the same time, they have from the client side pressure on sustainability and sustainability goals and uh, long term. So it's, it's quite a uh, pressure on two sides, but I think the reality shows that there is a starting beginning of a new thinking. And, and that, that's our hope also with respect to the next generation. The millennials, of course, they don't know what's going to expect them, but we as a decision maker today, we have to think about them and their future. Chris, that's a wonderful segue in for you because those are the people your your, your constituents. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's been such a great discussion, and uh, having all of these different perspectives uh, is is really enlightening. I think that um, as we from the private, we have to work together to address these systemic issues. And I think you asked the question of, well, would the next generation be willing to put? their money where their mouth is. I think we're seeing that, um, you know, that millennials and, and this next, this this workforce wants to work for businesses that do that. The consumers will buy from businesses that do that. And so, and investors are now looking to um, balance both the investment and the impact of, of their of their dollars. So I, I think uh, we're in a good space for that. Great. We have a lot of work to be done. Keep going at it, Chris. Keep going at it. Michael? Yeah, my, my closing thought is probably the more we share e with each other the opportunities we see, be that public sector or private sector, and the problems we want to solve, the more easily we find solutions together because everyone in the private sector wants to invest and see opportunity and make money. Everyone in the public sector wants to solve problems for society. Uh, the more we start telling each other what the other side should do, the further away we get from solutions. So educate each other, talk to each Thank other, you, but Michael. don't lecture each other. And Elodio, to you to wrap up the call. I, well, I think that uh, there are different formats for short-term and long-term uh, uh, investments. And uh, one thing I have to say is that the new generation, the millennials, I have uh, three millennials at home, they don't think long term. They think very, very short term. And governments, as you said, every four years they have elections, they have to do something in four years. So we have a dichotomy uh, here. And uh, some investors, you know, the ones who are willing to, to wait five to seven years, okay. But if it's longer term, very difficult. So we have really here a, a, a balance, difficult to, 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 uh, to match. And of course, the things, the easiest things are the ones, uh, especially government uh, infrastructures or health or something like that, they have to be within those four years of elections, unless they can be reelected. Otherwise, you know, even, you, you, you can even see in, even in America, you know, the big trillion dollar investment for infrastructures, 
has been always postponed because it's a long-term investment. Elodio, thanks very much indeed. I'd like to thank all of my panelists. You have been great. It's been a great conversation. I very much enjoyed meeting you and very much enjoyed the privilege of working with you on this call for harasses. I'd like to thank the audience as well, and particularly those in the audience who put forward questions for us. And uh, have, I hope that you've also enjoyed this uh, conversation. Thank you very much indeed, and enjoy the rest of the harasses event. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Goodbye. fantastic group. Eh? <laughs> you should keep in touch. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. Bye.